You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Apple Insider Podcast. I'm William Gallagher, sitting in for Victor, who's off having adventures. He's not gone far. You'll be hearing from him at regular intervals soon. But I'm here with Apple Insider's own Mike Worthily. Hello, Mike. Hello, William. It's almost like we did this just a week ago. Yes, yes. But you know what's happened in the meantime? Victor's clearly sold some Apple shares or something and bought an <laughs> island. And that's it. He's gone. Well, no, that's, I mean, that's not the case. I mean, what we're looking at here is Apple's... Well, you know what? There's actually a couple things to talk about today. And some of this might be outdated by tomorrow, but it might not. Uh, this morning at 10 o'clock, the various news agencies of the world uh, announced that Apple's market capitalization was $1 trillion. Except that wow. it wasn't. Oh. The the biggest problem with it is is they were using data from the day before. They were using Tuesday's data on Apple's outstanding shares as opposed to the numbers that Apple filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission on Wednesday. So, oh, so yeah, I mean it I mean I can see where you might miss that. I can see where you might do the calculation on Tuesday and say, Okay, this is the target we need to hit. I see where that might be the case, but Looking throughout my feeds right now, which is 11 o'clock in the morning, Eastern Coast time on Thursday, I see all of the big news agencies, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, MSNBC, you name it. They've all said that Apple's a trillion dollar company. Now, you know what, by the time you're listening to it, it may very well be. The share, let me just look up the share price that it needs to get, because we actually talked about this in an article just a few minutes ago. Apple needs to get to $207.05 to hit that number as opposed to $203.45. Okay. At present, Apple Apple stock is uh, Apple stock is not $201 as this ticker says, so that's wrong. Apple stock is presently $205.24 and is on the first slight decline of the day. It had briefly hit uh, $206.10. Uh, but, uh, you know, here we are. Uh, we're going to get there or we're not. And the thing is, is even when we say it might be a trillion dollars, it might not actually be accurate. Because if Apple if Apple bought back 100,000 shares today, even though they don't have to file just but once a quarter with the SEC on the outstanding numbers, it, it's still not going to be actually a trillion dollars, just mathematically a trillion dollars. The thing is, though, so, Apple's doomed. That's what this is the conclusion well, is here. <laughs> Um, yes, at some point the sun will burn out and we'll all die. But that day is not today and it is not soon. Um, I did the numbers not all that long ago. And if Apple just used their cash on, didn't sell another thing from here on, never released anything else, zero sales, zero products from today on, they're going to make it to like 2028 just on their cash alone with their existing employee count. Wow, momentum keeps them going that long. That's... So, you know, that that's kind of incredible. It, it's... The, and the Apple finances obviously were a bit earlier this week, and you've probably already read them at some length, uh, given that everyone is talking about them. So, But, I mean, how can you argue with these numbers that Apple put forth? It's just these mass, massively high volumes of sales and everything else. It's their best quarter, it's their best third quarter that they've ever had. You know, $53.3 billion in revenue on 41.3 million iPhone sales. Yeah. It, it's hard. It's hard to argue with these numbers, but still, Android's crushing them. Clearly, that's my take out from it. Actually, here in England, I realised I should have uh, checked how British media is covering this because uh, we talk about billions. We just throw that word around, and it's still the case in the UK that we tend to treat a billion as being a million millions and Americans as a thousand million. Now, as it happens, we officially adopted the American uh, way about 30 years ago, but it still isn't oh, catching on. Yes, I was somewhere in the 70s. There was an official governmental decree and everybody's ignored it. Kind of the way America sticks with Imperial. <laughs> I think. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I'm personally not that super excited about that. I actually read something a little bit earlier in this week about how Thomas Jefferson had commissioned for an actual kilogram to be shipped across the ocean. Yes. And the ship carrying the kilogram was attacked by pirates. Okay. And it, and it never and the kil the official kilogram never made it to the United States. Thus, 
stymieing that effort, which is an interesting saga, but you know, not really that relevant to this podcast. No. So, but if I do it really, really quickly, uh, equally irrelevant. But the the meter is in France, uh, and it's actual length that's a meter, and it isn't a meter long. There were two Frenchmen working on it, and one of them made a mistake, and the other covered for his pal. So this thing has always been wrong. <laughs> There we go. Uh, and this is oh, no. terribly relevant somehow. Uh, yeah, anyway, yes. let's talk about the earnings really quickly and some takeaways from earnings that are beyond the numbers. Yes. So looking at these numbers, this 41.3 million iPhone sales, Apple's most popular phone was still the iPhone ten. Yes. So everyone's saying, well, no one's going to buy this iPhone. This is, a, this is a doomed product. It's never going to sell. It's never going to do that great. And that followed through all the way up through the April earnings report when they finally said that, oh, well, wait, maybe we're wrong. The analysts, that is. Yeah. But still, still, the iPhone ten is the most popular model. And that's that's incredible and impressive considering the fact that this is a $1,000 phone. True, but uh, it's not going to be the most popular for very long, is it? No, that's fair enough. Um, yeah, we've got new models coming in right around a month. It, it's hard to say exactly when it's going to be probably 45 days or so from the recording of this podcast, middle of September-ish. Yeah. And um, we'll see what they come out with. I mean, there's some discussion now that there's three models of iPhone again, uh, with the middle model being the cheap model with an LCD phone and the 5.8 and the 6.2 models being OLED. Or excuse me, 6.5-inch model is OLED, um, like in the iPhone ten. So... <sighs> I mean, as always, we're, we're kind of gleaning stuff from the supply chain right now. I mean, we really don't have a good handle on exactly what Apple's going to do, but we have a good idea of their general approach, just given what we've seen so far. There have been dummies that have come out in the last week or so that people have, they say that they're CNC models. I mean, these are, these are wrong as often as they're right. So th it's, it's an interesting saga and it will continue to be an interesting saga. We knew a lot about the iPhone 10 before it came out. We didn't know everything about it. And it's those little details that make the product releases, for me at least. I'm more of a software guy than a harder one. So actually, in some ways, I yeah. kind of, I, I don't actively avoid looking into these things, but I try to ignore rumors and until I'm in the market to buy something. Like, I would like to replace my ancient iMac. So I keep an ear out mm -hmm. to see whether an iMac is going to be updated. Uh, but during the earnings call, when people talk about these massive sales and things, they were also saying everywhere that there are so many projects coming this year, products rather. Uh, you said three phones, but I'm also hearing iMacs, maybe the Mac Pro, iPads, at least one, a new watch, new AirPods. I mean, how solid is any of that? Or are people just wishing? Well, the Mac Pro we're hoping to see, but it's not going to ship until 2019. Apple's already said that 2019 is the modular Mac Pro. And let me just go off track for a little bit on that right now. If you've listened to this podcast or you've listened to my other podcast, which we'll talk about at the end of this episode, I am very, very concerned about what modular means. I don't think it means PCIe slots that the user can access. I, I don't think this means socketable processors that the user can easily replace. I think this means exactly what Apple wants it to mean, meaning modular. I, I think that if you're expecting a cheese grater Mac Pro, I, I don't think you're going to get it. I, I think you're going to get a lot of Thunderbolt expansion. I think you're going to get eGPUs. I, that's what I think Apple means by modular. And, I, and it's going to make people mad. I, I think that if Apple meant to say... In a PCIe upgradable Mac, I think they would have exactly said that. Okay. I think that they've picked their words very carefully on how to describe this. I would like to see this in the fall. I would like to see them say something about it at the very least, saying this is what it looks like. We'll be talking more about it next year. I don't think they're going to. Um, now, as far as the iMacs go, it's been a year. There are new processors that are suitable for the iMac 4K and 5K, so I think we'll see another update on that iMac Pro, not sure about that one yet. There are processors to use, but I'm not convinced that they're going to go in for another six months. Okay. Uh, iPads are inevitable because we've already seen information on them from European regulatory agencies, meaning numbers, and the numbers that were filed with the European regulatory agencies popped up with the Mac Pros from two weeks ago, or with the uh, MacBook Pros from two weeks ago. All right, so... <laughs> 
we won't know and we can't confirm any details until it happens, but we do know. The coming, unless Apple just decides at the last minute, nah, let's leave it to next year, there is a lot of stuff coming from Apple this year. Yeah, we have not, as much as I want it personally, we have not seen anything in regards to a new Mac Mini. Hmm. But let's keep these things in a little bit of perspective. We're looking at about four to five million Mac sales a month. On a slow month, we're looking at 41 million iPhone sales a month. Right. How much easier is it to hide a new Mac Mini than it is to hide a new iPhone? Okay. Well, people are very diligently looking for clues. I mean, it's Scooby-Doo land out there of people pouncing <laughs> on things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, we have our own sources and other leakers have their own sources and we talk about the ones that make sense and the ones that are absolutely ridiculous. We either say they're aculous, absolutely ridiculous or we pass on them entirely. Yes. So it, it's, it, I mean, this is a tough tough front line to walk with, with rumor reports and rumor stories. So, like I said, a, a lot of them turn out to be wrong. Like we've been hearing about blue iPhones for about three years. Oh, right. And is this the year? I, I don't know. Uh, it, it, but that rumor about multiple colors is back again. I actually like some of the sillier rumours. So they're kind of sweet, in a way. Uh, an iPhone that will run OS ten, OS ten. Listen to me, Mac OS or something. That would be <laughs> entertaining. But okay. let's. Well, there, yeah. There's no reason why not. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about new frameworks to migrate developers to using to basically Project Marzipan is what I'm stumbling over right here where there are a lot of efforts in place to have combined user interface libraries to make it easier to migrate iPad apps over to the Mac. There is a lot of discussion about an A-series processor Mac migrating uh, lower-end Macs, I think lower-end Macs, to an ARM processor like the A14 or something like that in the future. And I, I think that as long as Intel keeps missing deadlines that they set, keeps missing delivery guidances that they set, I think that this is going to happen sooner rather than later. It's it's why we did these shifts two other times. Yeah. It's why Apple shifted to PowerPC back in the day. It's why Apple shifted to Intel in 2006. It's because chip suppliers weren't keeping their promises. But, yeah, this is Intel, possibly the biggest chip supplier in the world. They know what they're doing, no? Well, they know what they're doing, but I, they make guesses when they're going to ship something based on how they think it's going. And then they'll hit some kind of physics-based limitation and go, oh, man, now we're stuck. Right. The 10-nanometer process we've been waiting for for three years. Yes. From Intel. And it's well, not just waiting. I mean, it's, it was supposed to be delivered. They announced that it was coming in a year, three years ago, and now we're two years late on it. So... I, I think that at some point Apple's just going to say, well, you know, we can do this now, so let's do it. And if you think that they don't have a macOS version running on ARM right now, I, I don't even know what to tell you. <laughs> yes, because they did run the Intel one. Was it five years? Five versions of OS X were secretly yep. running on Intel mm -hmm. as well. They can keep a secret that lot, can't they? They can. I mean, I think it was easier to do so in 2001 than it is now. Yes, that's um, true. Just because of the size of the company more than anything else. And the attention but, um, it gets um, from outside. Yep. Everything is Apple's yep. fault, for example. Okay. Um, let's just pull this thought about poor victim Apple and ponder. Before we talk about uh, a thing that's actually going to take money away from them, Imagine learning new recipes from Gordon Ramsay or photography tips from Annie Leibovitz. Now you can with Masterclass. Masterclass offers online classes taught by the best in the world. Each class is shot with cinematic production quality and offers on-demand lessons loaded with exclusive content you'll find only on Masterclass. You can choose lessons from classes taught by over 35 masters, including Malcolm Gladwell on interviewing, Ron Howard on collaboration, astronaut Chris Hadfield on traveling to Mars, and so many more. Plus, new classes are always being added. I've been looking at classes by Judd Apatow, Malcolm Gladwell, Ron Howard, and Steve Martin. Whether you're pursuing your passion or developing your career, you'll find a masterclass for you. Masterclass has even been featured by the New York Times, Vanity Fair, and ESPN. For a limited time, Apple Insider listeners get a free seven-day trial at masterclass.com slash Apple Insider. Learn from the best in the world at masterclass.com slash Apple Insider. 
That's masterclass.com slash Apple Insider. So Apple this week, there they are. They're having a party. You should hear the earnings call. It's just, you know, cheers and everything all the time. Um, <laughs> and then, no, says South Korea, we want some money from you. Now, I think you actually know more about this than I do, but Korea, South Korean government uh, is going to impose taxes. It makes it sound like they haven't before. Yeah. Yeah, uh, South Korea has decided that their immunity for foreign companies in local taxes is no more, and they're going to move quickly to impose taxes on Apple and Google and Amazon. Um, they've caught a lot of heat from Samsung because Samsung is getting taxed in South Korea, and politicians complain about it, saying that's reverse discrimination, and that South Korean companies both pay taxes and have to abide by regulations, but foreign firms don't necessarily have to do so. You know, here's the thing. Apple and South Korea have a long history. It's in November, South Korea raided Apple's offices in the country uh, in an ongoing probe about business practices. And, you know, I'm, I'm taxation in Apple is such a tricky subject. They've got international quarter. They've got international headquarters all over the world. They've got offices all over the world. They got Apple stores all over the world. And. Apple is set up the most advantageous tax deal that they can in accordance with the laws of the European Union and Ireland and all these other countries. Uh, of course they would. Anybody they would, yes. But. Does it mean that they're paying a fair share? No, it, it doesn't mean they're paying a fair share. It means that they're paying the lowest share possible for their responsibility for their shareholders that they can wrangle. Well, that's a good phrase, the it, responsibility. I mean, it's uh, the difference between tax avoidance and something illegal, isn't it? They are doing mm -hmm. precisely uh, what the law requires, but their obviously motivation is to do it for the least they possibly can. And right. uh, I, I mean, I'm in England, so, you know, next door to Ireland. I've been following that one a little while. I don't think it's fair that Apple pays so little, but I think it's completely fair that they agreed it with the government and they've done what they've said. So this reversal, this uh, trying to get money back from pre-arrangement, that seems unfair to me. But going on, you know, why shouldn't South Korea charge Apple a higher rate if that's the law? Yeah, I mean, and that's kind of my point here is while I may not morally approve of the Ireland deal as it regards as it refers to the rest of the European Union at this point, we're not going to really delve into that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And while we're not, well, I don't necessarily approve that Apple isn't paying taxes in South Korea as a corporation. I, I think that as long as they're operating legally, I, I'm not sure that anyone has a leg to stand on that much in regards to it as far as a corporate behavior point of view. It, it's as long as the company is operating legally, then they are, like I said, they are doing what they're supposed to be doing by law for their shareholders. So ultimately, so, the country changes the law, they pay more money, that's yeah. it. I mean, would I be upset if Apple had to pay more taxes? I don't think so. Would I be upset if Apple maintained their current tax deals? Mm, don't think so. I mean, there's, as with anything else, none of this is binary. None of this is a toggle switch where it's yes or no, where it's cut and dried. There, I mean, everything in here is a shade of gray all the way through it. Except the cumulative effect of more tax could pull Apple back from being a trillion dollar company, you know. In, in theory, it's. But are we really concerned that Apple's going to run out of money anytime soon? Well, I, I'm kind of still genuinely actually. I was going to say as a joke that I'm still rooting for them, but I've been an Apple fan since they barely survived. So I kind of like it when they're doing better. I love that moment when um, Apple's shares are worth uh, exceeded Dell's for the first time, and of course Michael mm -hmm. Dell would sell that thing about selling them off to get money. I genuinely enjoyed. <laughs> that day um that quote that quote from michael dell has had more press in the last yes. 10 years than i think he could have ever hoped it would and not in a good way because no. no matter what you say not all press is good press i did once go to a presentation about businesses and somebody held up dell as being an absolute shining example of how to do the right thing and i looked at it and i realized they hadn't updated their slides in about six years because it had utterly shot itself in the foot since. Um, so I kind of stopped listening to the advice after that. I mean, Dell's back and doing all sorts of things now, it's fine. But at that moment, I genuinely was amused by corporate success and failure. And it was like characters in a drama. And Well, yeah, I mean, it's funny you should mention that because now they're talking about going public again. Yes. Yeah. I mean, they went private, I want to say, four years ago. 
in you know in a lot of drama about that about share pricing and what they were going to pay for each share and now to generate money they're looking at going public again so this doesn't seem like a lot of corporate success to me i mean they're not hurt they're not scrounging in the sofa for coffee money or anything like that but no, it'd be interesting to it's, know what happened in the time before uh what put them in a position where it was better to go public again or not but this is stuff i wish we knew and we don't we do hear about these things yeah 10 years after the event and things. Mm, uh, actually, more. you yeah. and Victor were saying in the last episode about uh, the inside stories of Apple uh, uh, coming out now many, many years later. And I think for an anorak like me, actually, that is that a uh, well-known term? It's an American term for a nerdy geek. <laughs> you, you probably need to translate yes. on that one, yeah. <laughs> uh, we talk about uh, anoraxia, you know, wearing too big an anorak. <laughs> um, for people like me, that kind of insider detail of a company specifically Apple, I think, but generally all of them, is terribly interesting. But these are the decisions that are happening now and are making effects on countries, you know, with taxation and on products that we mm -hmm. buy, and we never hear about them. Um, it's almost like companies, it'd be nice if companies were more accountable, which I suppose actually is a whole point of the earnings call. Apple is legally required, I think, to give its figures and things. Um, so at least we know Apple doesn't tell you anything it doesn't have to and it has to there so that's how we know some things so the earnings calls are a good thing aren't they? Yeah, uh, you know, they're required I mean it's mandatory to do these earnings reports but yeah. you know Maybe they should release them on albums or something the best earning calls ever I'm just going to consider that for a moment and think about music This episode is brought to you by Jamf Now Jamf now makes it easy to set up and manage and protect your Apple devices. It's easy to keep track of your own Mac, iPad, or iPhone, but what about the other Apple devices at work? As a business grows, so does its digital inventory, making it harder to manage everyone's Apple devices. This is especially true if employees are remote. With Jamf now, you can check your digital inventory, distribute Wi-Fi and email settings, deploy apps, protect company data, and even lock or wipe a device as needed from anywhere. Jamf now manages devices so you can focus on your business instead. No IT experience needed. And now, Apple Insider podcast listeners can start securing your business today by setting up your first three devices for free, forever. Add more for just $2 a month per device. Create your free account today at jamf.com slash appleinsider. That's J-A-M-F dot com slash Apple Insider. We, we took out all these massive numbers for Apple, but there's little numbers that are interesting as well, like the HomePod taking, I think the quote is a uh, small but meaningful portion that's just a yeah, I, they're saying now that the HomePod is doing reasonably well in the United States market. There, There's a research study that came out on Thursday suggesting that the HomePod has sold about 3 million units and in the United States and has an install base of around 6%. Um, this is actually way better than what analysts were saying back in April when they suggested that it was the HomePod was selling 10 units a day at Apple retail stores that it was available in. Which would lead that, which would by the end of the year means that Apple would have only sold like 600,000 of them. Sorry, 10 a day per shop. Per store, yeah. Um, it's so that, I mean, that didn't make any sense in April, and we said it didn't make any sense in April. Yeah. Uh, this, this three, let's keep this in perspective. These three million home pods here, this is one billion dollars. Right. This by itself is a billion dollars since the, since the home pod shipped, and it still hasn't seen a Christmas. Oh, that's a good point. They just missed last Christmas, didn't they? Mm -hmm. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. Are we not at the stage, though, where a certain type of buyer is going to be thinking, it's been out for a while now, there's going to be HomePod 2, the sequel, and so they might actually hold off this Christmas as well? I don't think so. I, and the reason why I, I think that I think that we're looking at a situation where it'll be like the AirPods. Yeah where we've got you've got something that's like well it was cool last christmas and it's music so it's still going to be cool this christmas there there have been a lot of discussions that there's going to be a smaller home pod but i'm given that it hasn't seen one christmas i'm i, I don't think we're going to see that let's just say for the first time today i was on a train ride and i had forgotten my airpods and genuinely really annoyed at it because they are so good for it but hmm okay haven't got a home pod though Yes, uh, but actually, you're supposed to get two, aren't you, just to make Apple happy? Well, yeah. Let me talk about that really briefly. I do have two. I I know you're shocked <laughs> at this revelation. And 
one of them was really nice. I thought one of them was really, really good. And it was a nice, it was a nice speaker at many volumes, low to high. And so that meant, that meant I could put it on low for nighttime listening, uh, because my kids like hearing music at night and I could put it higher when, you know, I'm trying to rock the house. I'm throwing the, the Dio horns right now. You can't see them on the, on the podcast, obviously, but, um, while I'm working, I typically have some form of music on depending on my mood on any given day. But then I paired two of them together and that completely blew me out of the water. Oh, great. The way you were saying, I thought you were going to say like you were let down by the second, but no. No. Great. No, it's, I mean, we have, we have two of them in the house. One of them is mine and one of them is another family members. And she bought that one separately. And I, you know, they were, they were gone one day. So I, you know, I appropriated it to, to test it out. And man, is that good? <laughs> man, is that nice? And it, it doesn't, it, the stereo sound is amazing. I mean, it's like if you are of a certain age, you remember back to stereophonic records. And the first time you heard something that used the left channel and the right channel, not in sequence. And it, it was one of those revelatory moments. And this is the same kind of thing. It, Good earbuds like the AirPods, the sound from them, it doesn't actually sound like it's in your ear. It sounds like in your head somewhere. Yeah. And this delivers that with speakers as opposed to HomePod, as opposed to earbuds. So, yeah, anyway, I mean, this is get it, but save enough money for a second one and you won't be sorry. How about that? That's good. But I'm now, I'm picturing them either side of your, your, your Mac screen. Is it that close or are you just anywhere in the room? Uh, you may need to clarify the question. I mean, I've I've got multiple setups for testing and things like that. I've got my receiver and I've got speakers pointed at me, and I've got the home pods are further away from me. But honestly, I, I prefer the home pod sound. If if that's what you're asking, I think it is. Uh, and it's anywhere in the room, really. I mean, I I can be in one corner of the room or another corner of the room. I've set them up in my much larger living room, and it and it doesn't seem to matter. The the there's no sweet spot like there can be with aimed speakers. Okay, we are now going to end this podcast early because I'm just going to go buy two. You're just going to go buy uh, one? Do they have them in blue? Uh, no, they do yeah. not. Okay. No. I'll tell you one thing. Uh, Maybe, you know, let, let's start a rumor. Yes, they'll come <laughs> yes. in blue. No, it, 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 yeah, it's not. I, it's, I don't see Apple shifting much from black or white on this. I don't. I do actually really fancy um, this idea of ambient computing with them being able to make and take phone calls of them just from the air. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I understand that's recently become more possible it used to be you had to make the call on your phone and hand it over uh, uh have you had a chance to test that is it as good as i imagine this is what you're talking about is in the newest private betas so i wish i've had a chance to test it i really haven't had the opportunity to do much in the way of phone calls on the home pod just because of my home environment and it's loud and you know Nobody not certain to my to children you. necessarily need right. to hear well people want to talk to me but okay. i'm not certain my children need to hear the intricacies of you know what's going on <laughs> with this venue or another right and otherwise i'm going to have another one of those events like that uh, european presenter whose kid did a fun yes. march onto the television <laughs> you know about about a year ago at this point now yeah. so so sweet um but but, but yeah i mean circling back a little bit this is another one of those products that's rumored to see a refresh soon but i i, I don't think so I, I i i think not this year i think maybe next so you think it's like the apple watch uh, it's not going to be that every year there's a new one and everybody who bought the old one is, is slightly angry at it they're going to keep a longer form factor than they do with phones well the apple watch is very much like that the the series three is I, I think we're looking at a series four imminently I, I think we will see that in september um I'm, they're looking at a, a larger usable screen area as compared to the body of the of the device itself now whether that means a larger screen or whether that means smaller bezels we don't know yet uh but it, it's it's Apple rumors, right? I mean, a lot of things could happen. A lot of things couldn't happen. There were a lot of rumors before WWDC that said that Apple was going to release all these things. And Apple Insider is one of the only places that said, maybe not. Yes. But on the other hand, a September event very nearly always has more than the iPhone. And sometimes they just do, okay, well, this is the iPhone. And then a month later they go, okay, here's the IMAX. Have a great day. Yes. You know, or again, what they could do is like what they did with the iPhone SE and the latest MacBook Pro. Here's a press release with the new hardware. There is one thing we uh, do actually know, though, which is that watchOS um, 5 
will no longer run on every watch the original version yep. is of. And I oddly was a little quite sad when I heard about that, mostly because my wife Angela has an original watch. I did have an original watch until it went horribly wrong and Apple repaired it and basically just didn't bother fixing it, sent me a Series 1 instead. Thank you very much, Apple. Yeah, uh, there you go. Yeah, it feels like it must be... It feels like the time to make a hardware change if they're going to do that as well, but now I'm guessing as well. Okay. Well, this is this isn't the first time that Apple's done that, right? I mean, the original iPad only went up to iOS five. Yes, and my mother it, it was still loves it, except JohnLewis.com, her favorite shop. The website won't work; it just crashes her oh, iPad. No. So I've had to loan her my original iPad Air instead. And actually, <laughs> she doesn't like it as much. And it's quite fascinating to see what she doesn't like. There are things that... Well, now I have to ask, why? Well, uh, one of the things that uh, iOS added for iPads is Apple wants you to see as much of a website as possible. And the, the controls, the furniture go away. So she'll bring up johnlewis.com, she'll tap on something in the middle, the, the menu bar goes away and things. And now she says, well, how do I go somewhere else? She's kind of quite hard to remember where to tap to bring that up. Oh, and okay. that's a really interesting point, I thought. Uh, plus, she she's now got over this, but she hated the keyboard. Um, she calls it the printer for some reason. She's in her 80s, she doesn't use computers much, but she calls it the printer, and she used to prefer okay. it on the original iPad because the keys uh, were always in caps. No matter whether they were lowercase or not, they looked like they were caps, and she got used to where they were. And so she didn't like it that the iPad Air has mixed case, depending on what your process shipped. But last time I saw her, she was complaining about something, uh, and she just flew through that keyboard. I'm expecting next week she's going to be a, a swift programmer or something, but it's taken her a while to get there. Wow, swift programmer. Okay, that's lofty. Yes. I mean, you have to get her a Mac for that. That's true, and Xcode, but, you know, we're working there. Udemy is the largest and most accessible online marketplace with the most courses, teachers, and opportunities for students everywhere around the globe. Udemy has over 65,000 courses from coding to comic book art available anywhere on their website and app. One of the things that I love about podcasting and about listening to podcasts is the learning experience. To be able to open up my ideas to others and to listen to new ideas in a space that a, a decade ago wouldn't really have been available. And that reminds me of another great learning tool I found called Udemy. And Udemy has courses on everything from Python and AWS on the technical side of things to drawing and to, to gosh, things like mindfulness and meditation. There's, there's something for everyone there. With over 65,000 courses, Udemy is the largest space for online learning. Udemy has something for everyone, whether I'm at home, at the desk, on the computer, or using their app on my phone. Udemy gives me access to new knowledge wherever I am. You guys need to check out Udemy. They've helped students all over the world improve their skills, their careers, and their lives. And they've helped me set up this exclusive offer for our listeners only. Go to ude.my slash Apple Insider right now and get 90% off when you sign up for classes. You won't find a better price, so sign up for classes now using my link, ude.my slash Apple Insider, and get access to life-changing classes for 90% off. And make sure you download their app for your phone so you can stream your studies wherever you are. That's ude.my slash Apple Insider. ude.my slash Apple Insider. Keyboards. That's the thing that I care about very much because I write on them. I mean, as I look around, I can see I've got four keyboards on this desk and only one of them is actually connected to anything. Um, I understand <laughs> I should hoard these because they're going away. Well, I mean... Yeah. Here's the thing, and I've predicted this for a while too. Apple has got is clearly doing some work and on replacing the keyboard on a MacBook Pro with a touch surface. With a dynamic surface like an extended touch bar just over the entire keyboard. And if you think about it, why else would Apple have made the key travel so shallow on the 2016 MacBook Pro? Because it's nicer to type there, on, ergonomically better. I don't know that it is, but you know, is that not possible? I'm, I'm not convinced it is. But I mean, it's divisive. I mean, I, I've typed on so many keyboards throughout my life. I don't think my fingers care at this point. I, they'll just type on whatever is a keyboard. No, I care. I mean, think yeah. of the ergonomic horror that was the Apple IIe keyboard, right? 
Right, I'm trying to picture that one. That wasn't the strangely distorted one that moved and clicked together. No, like no, 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 no. That that was no, that was the ergonomic keyboard. That was an ADB keyboard from I want to say around '93. I don't have the numbers right in front of me. That sounds right. But the Apple IIe keyboard on the Apple IIe was elevated about the base of it was ele- because of the design of the computer. The base was elevated about two inches off your desk oh, yes, surface, yes. and the keyboard was was canted at about a, a twenty degree angle. So you had to hover your arms over the keyboard to write on that. So I don't have car- tar- carpal tunnel syndrome just from being a, a, a preteen and a young man. I have no idea. Maybe I've looped around. Maybe it's just so bad that it doesn't matter anymore. All I remember about the ergonomic keyboard is that we were required to have them in whatever office I was working in. And you'd have it. It was a keyboard that split in the middle and you could move it various degrees around. You'd have it all the way out. You'd type nice. Mm-hmm. And then whenever there was a deadline, forget it. Slam it together type like mad so that was that's my i, I know it's terribly satisfying i'm working here crack back together and onwards i miss that the, bit the the best thing about that keyboard is the detachable numeric keypad um and way 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 back when i had a client that had just gotten rid of all of their their ergo keyboards and had one lone numeric keypad sticking around i'm like hey can i take that from you and they're like yeah take it we're not using it for anything so that was the best for a while and then USB came around and it was over. So Actually, I mean, if everything became like the touch bar, I, I don't have a MacBook with a keyboard, uh, touch bar, but every time I've used it, I've actually rather liked it. Uh, you do use it at all. Do you find you actually use the keys? And can you do it without looking, for example? Can you touch type? <sighs> the touch bar is so polarizing. It, I like it in concept. I, I like the theory of the touch bar. It's when I'm using my machine... I have a couple different places in the house that I work for a couple of different reasons. And when I'm down here at my desk, I have my, my MacBook Pro is elevated on a floating shelf and is next to a monitor I've got bolted to the wall, basically. And for that, I use a, a wireless keyboard. And But when I'm elsewhere in the house, then it'll be just be me and the MacBook Pro. And in that case, I will use it, but it's it's certainly not a, 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 a touch typing kind of thing. You have to look down, you have to see what the contextual button is, and you have to tap it. Now, you know, we've I've used Better Touch Tool, and so mm-hmm. have you, obviously, because we that. wrote about it about two weeks ago now. And I think that's, right now, as it stands, I think that's indispensable. The touch bar is not so polarizing for me that I, no, never, I'm never going to use it to, to heck with Apple. Let's go light the campus on fire. I mean, it, there are people who are like that. But I, I think that, as with most everything else, the touch bar is something that Apple wants to make, and they're making the best machine that they want to make. Whether or not it explicitly appeals to you or me or any other Apple Insider listener, I'm not sure how relevant that is. Uh, there, There is a larger market, and it's not us anymore. And I'm putting us in quotes because that means you and me and the Apple Insider readers. Yeah. It's their... You know, and, and frankly, the term MacBook Pro is a marketing term more than anything else. You know, you, you don't have to use a MacBook Air if you're not making money on it, and you don't have to use a MacBook Pro if you are. So, and... It can be easy to lose the fact that just because Apple is not aiming a machine squarely at your forehead doesn't mean that they're actively trying to hose you on hardware. Plus, of course, so. if there's a type of MacBook or, or notebook really that we want, we could just go make one. I'm sorry, what? Well, I mean, I'm not saying it wouldn't take some effort and time, but we could, <laughs> you know, put our backs into it. The thing, actually, I keep leaping onto that is that you have to look at the touch bar. And I've realised I can touch yeah. type on my iPad's virtual keyboard. I'm much slower, but I don't have to look at the keys mm-hmm. on that. Is it purely the fact that it's not always there? It depends on where you're using it. You might get used to it if it was... If you're... A wireless keyboard had a similar thing, for example. I think so. It's, like I said, my 2016 MacBook Pro, like I said, 50% of the words are from Apple Insider on that, 50 on the wireless, on my wireless keyboard. I use it on occasion. But but like I said, I don't actively hate it. it I, I think that, as with everything else in computing, if it's not the right tool for the right job, then don't use it. And if it is, then modify it so it's the perfect tool for the job as opposed to just the right tool for the job. This is more flexible than function keys, but it's not as inherently finger-homing as mechanical function keys are. Though, remember so. the reason we're talking about this at all is this idea that the whole keyboard might go that way, in which case yep. uh, it might, at points, it may be the only tool available to you, which... Yeah, yeah. 
unless you go external, which is a, this is a keep in mind this is a possibility. This is not a certainty. But there have been a couple of different rumors saying that Apple is looking at doing things like this going back a couple different going back a couple of years. So this isn't this isn't new. This is just the latest saga, the latest chapter in the saga. And to be fair, Apple is only a trillion dollar company. So what do they know? Mm. Yeah. Well, and and they do a lot of patent work on things that never see the light of day. Right. Okay. I'm going to take that as a as a keyboard fanatic. I'll take that as you throwing me a little bone. I can go away happy. <laughs> but let's just stop there before you change my mind. And let me just point out, this has been another episode of the Apple Insider Podcast. I'm William Gallagher. He's Mike Weatherly. Mike, you say you write all over the house. Where can we track you down online? Well, online, you can find me just about literally seven days a week on appleinsider.com. And if you want to hear a podcast with me on it that's a little saltier than this <laughs> one, you can find me at spacejavelin.com every Monday. Right. Um, all the actions on appleinsider.com, though, isn't it? We know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the action is on appleinsider.com. It's just saltier and more opinionated okay. on Space Javelin. Well, if you have a split view and you have Space Javelin on one side, Appasod on the other, do kind of swipe over to Twitter and you can find me on at W Gallagher and it'll be fun to see you there. Nice talking to you. Good seeing you, Mike, and goodbye, everybody. See you later, everybody. Jamf now makes it easy to set up, manage, and protect your Apple devices so you can focus on your business. No IT experience needed. With Jamf now, you can check your digital inventory, distribute Wi-Fi and email settings, deploy apps, protect company data, and even lock or wipe a device as needed from anywhere. And now, Apple Insider podcast listeners can start securing your businesses today by setting up your first three devices for free forever. Add more for just $2 a month per device. Create your free account today at jamf.com slash appleinsider. That's jamf.com slash appleinsider. Insider.